Hey folks, we're glad to see you. Come on in, find a seat, move to the center of the aisles because, no, move to the center of the rows because we're expecting a lot of people in the theater tonight. Um, and we're really glad to have you with us. Just going to give it another minute or two as people are coming in. Um, yes, you will notice, and I'm not at all surprised that it's Bonnie kicking us off, that the chat is enabled. If you'd like to feel less alienated by the alienating webinar format, um, we encourage you to pop into the chat and let us know who you are and where you're from. Um, we got well over 300 folks in here so far, so it will be really neat to hear who's with us. Um, now people are starting to raise their hands. It's hard to know what that means, but in general, I'd say we're not gonna call on you right now. So <laughs> unless something's wrong, um, which could be. And we are still growing. So we'll just take a minute here and keep on, keep on going. It's great to see you here. Um, Josh is a big draw for sure. He has been for us at Plymouth State for a long time because uh, we've been trying to get him with us um, since the before times, if you remember those days. No, we don't. Um, all right, looks like we're settling down a little bit um, with our attendees and I just want to welcome you all here um you know i know you're in all different time zones for, but for us in the us here on the east coast it is the end of the friday afternoon and i know many of you were probably not thinking that another zoom was exactly what you needed at this time so believe me when i say i'm very grateful that you have made time and space um, to be with us today from whatever time zone you are in and a particular shout out um, to my colleagues at Plymouth State, who are really the reason that we are here. Um, many of us are engaged in a learning community called the Cluster Pedagogy Learning Community. Um, this is a group of faculty and staff who are exploring interdisciplinary, project-based, and open styles of learning. And uh, before COVID, we many of us in the what we call the CPLC had read Josh's book, how humans learn and um, had had some discussions about that book and we're really excited for him to kind of wrap up our learning community by coming and visiting with us um, at what we were, we were planning a banquet, you guys. Can you even remember the days when your institution could have a banquet? I can't remember those days, um, but that was the original plan for this. And uh, when, when that was prevented by, by COVID and by um, budget issues, we were just so grateful to talk to Josh later and that he was willing to come remotely um, and, and actually retool his talk a little bit because so many things have shifted obviously in our world um, since we first invited him. In fact, I wanted to go back in time for just a minute when I was thinking back to when we read How Humans Learn. Uh, I wanna quote a little reflection that my colleague, Dr. Liz All in the English department at Plymouth State wrote after reading um, one of Josh's chapters on curiosity. So she wrote, um, according to Eiler, curiosity is an essential part of the way human beings learn, and it always has been. In order to learn something, we must first wonder about it. And then Liz started wondering herself. She wrote, must that wonder be arrived at alone or somehow innately? How, it, as a teacher, can I encourage that wondering? What circumstances or activities might I present to invite students into a wondering that they might not have come to organically? Eiler offers that there are analogous to curiosity ideas like interest and novelty and wonder, and that quote, some have posited that curiosity is a kind of exploration or have linked it to creativity. Liz writes, the more I read and reflect, the more I'm fascinated by curiosity as it functions in learning, as it's connected to creativity, as it supports what we call critical thinking. I actually got a little misty when I was reading that because I was thinking about before COVID how passionate so many of us were in reading Josh's book 
to rethink how, um, how we come to the creative spark of learning. Um, but then I looked at some of the words in what Liz was talking about here, curiosity, exploration, creativity, critical thinking. And to a certain degree, these are not words we've been able to access as much during COVID. Um, we have a whole new set of words, I think, um, that have emerged since, since the pandemic um, and the crisis that we had to navigate together. And I know that part of what Josh is gonna be so great at doing is not taking that new world that we've been immersed in for the last year and merging it with some of that stuff uh, that we read about in How Humans Learn that was so inspiring to us. Um, so if you don't know Josh Eiler, and I bet most of you do, um, he is the Director of Faculty Development at the University of Mississippi. Uh, previously, he had similar positions at Rice and at George Mason. Um, his background is in literature, comp and ret, um, and disability studies. But recently, now that he's working more in teaching and learning, he's been writing about all sorts of hot issues. Um, uh, what does it mean to give a lecture? Should we ban technology, certain kinds of technology in our classrooms? Um, what about student shaming? Um, what role does resilience play? And in general, what's coming next for instructional design? When I got the position here um, as the director of the Open Learning Teaching and Collaborative um, at Plymouth State, I was really inspired by Josh because he's one of the people out in the public sphere who is constantly thinking about teaching, talking about teaching, and demonstrating a real care for teaching. Um, and he likes to have those conversations, not just with other teachers, um, but with staff, with students. Um, so I think he's a really wonderful person to talk to what I'm sure is a very diverse group of folks tonight. Before I turn it over to Josh, I just want to explain that because this is um, sponsored by our Cluster Pedagogy Learning Community, um, we, we had grant money from the Davis Education Foundation and from Plymouth State University. What we've asked Josh to do, we wanted to make this keynote public so as many people could participate as, as want to. We're gonna be using the hashtag PSUopen. Um, maybe my colleague Martha Burtis can pop that into the chat. So feel free to use Twitter as a way of talking with each other or asking Josh questions. But the real Q&A after this talk is going to happen in a separate Zoom uh, just for the faculty, staff, and students at Plymouth State. So um, I apologize for that, but it's part of the way we make the work public, but also maintain some, um, some community activities where we can really build community amongst our, our own group. So Plymouth State folks um, head into the separate Zoom after Josh is finished with his keynote. So with that, I welcome Joshua Eiler and thank you so much for being with us, Josh. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thanks for that amazing introduction. I feel like you set the expectations up here and I usually like them maybe down here. <laughs> uh, no, it's this is wonderful. I've learned from Robin for so many years about teaching and learning. And so uh, I was honored to be invited last year and honored to uh, participate this year. You're right. I can't remember what banquets are. I think I'd settle for a Golden Corral buffet at this point, you know, um, but uh, yeah wonderful to, to be with you all. I really admire the work of the CoLab and, and the work that Robin and Martha and their colleagues do there. And as I look over in the chat, it's like an episode of This Is Your Life. Uh, so many uh, beloved friends are in there, so many folks I know from social media. And so uh, I appreciate you all taking some time out of your day today to, uh, to talk about what is, I think, on many of our minds. Um, but what I've been struck by over the last few months, well, the last year or so, is that we don't talk about it very much at all. So <clears throat> I want to note a couple of things here at the beginning because Robin mentioned Twitter and our hashtag. Down here at the bottom of the screen, I do have my uh, email address and my Twitter handle. Please feel free to tweet comments or questions, uh, You know, include my handle. I promise that uh, that uh, later on tonight over the weekend, I will I'll respond and engage in that conversation, or you can email me as well. Um, you know, the point of having conversations like this is to really engage with each other and to move forward together. So I'm really uh, happy to happy to be a part of that. Uh, I'll be focused on making sense uh, during the actual talk uh, rather than the, the tweets, but I look forward to seeing them. 
Um, okay, so I'm gonna open with just a couple of disclaimers. Uh, first uh, is that uh, grief is not the lightest topic in the world. And so we are gonna talk about some kind of heavy stuff. And I think one of the things about grief is that when you talk about it, it can maybe uh, trigger some memories of other times that we've grieved. So just a heads up that, you know, we will be diving into uh, what, is not a, what, what is not an unchallenging topic. Uh, second disclaimer, not a shock to anyone. I am not a psychologist, uh, and I don't even get to play one on TV, which is sad to me. Uh, but uh, I do think psychologists are awesome people, and I'm not just saying that because so many of them are here right now. Uh, but because I'm not one of them, uh, this talk will be less about research on grief than it will be about um, thinking of grief as a process by which we reconcile loss in order to fashion something new. So uh, I'll, I'll be kind of taking that tack on it. So I'm gonna begin with what I hope is an uncontroversial premise that the people who learn and who teach and who work in higher education are human beings with rich emotional, uh, and rich and complex emotional lives and that a part of that emotional landscape are different ways of handling loss uh, that we might put under a general umbrella of grief and that we grieve in many individualized ways, but where we connect, uh, where, where we are the same, I think, in our grieving about many different kinds of loss is in the messiness of the process. Uh, it's not necessarily the connect the dots sort of process that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross famously published decades ago. It's much more like um, what I find in Joan Didion's really powerful book, The Year of Magical Thinking. Grief is messy, it is iterative, it pops up when you least expect, uh, expect it. Uh, it doesn't pop up when you're most expecting it. Uh, the, the range of responses that we have are um, unpredictable. And uh, I want to take that as the jumping off point to this quote that I have on the screen. Uh, I read this just a few weeks ago in the periodical Education Week. Uh, <clears throat> and I want, to, I, I want to read this out loud. This is the only thing that I'll read word for word, but I think it is uh, essential enough and powerful enough that it bears reading. They, the students, are grieving, as am I. We are in desperate need of someone to tell us it is all right if you cannot operate as your pre-pandemic self. Let us as educators be the voice that tells our children, I see you and I hear you and it is okay to grieve. What is an education for if not to show students what it means to be human? That part, that last part uh, was really what grabbed me because I think higher education at its best uh, prepares students, at least in part, for building meaningful and purposeful lives. And part of the way that we can do that is to show our own humanity as faculty. And this connects to something that Bell Hooks writes about in Teaching to Transgress, that by being vulnerable ourselves, that by being human ourselves and showing that humanity, uh, we can uh, help students discover the same about themselves. And in this, uh, in this particular moment, at this particular time with all of you, the human element that I really want to talk about is grieving the various losses uh, that we have undergone over the last 15 or so months, and particularly uh, how it ties to our work in higher education. So the, this, uh, this wonderful passage here by Claire Marie Grogan, a, a, a teacher in K-12, um, really highlights a couple of, uh, I think, essential things. And one of those things is simply to have someone say, it is okay to grieve. It is okay to feel like something really uh, tumultuous has happened and to grieve that loss. Now, there's no shortage of things, I think, right now that, uh, that we could be grieving. On, you know, on the one hand, uh, they're the deeply personal losses that meant that people may have incurred losing friends or family in the pandemic. There's the, the grief uh, that's tied to current events, the fragility of our democracy, uh, the, the political turmoil, police violence, 
anything and everything uh, that, that is tied to the state of our world today. Uh, and then there's the collective grief of losing what uh, higher ed meant to us 15 months ago and trying to refashion something uh, going forward. Now, the, uh, those certainly aren't the only things people might be grieving, and they are also importantly intersectional. People might be feeling different elements of those uh, different types of grief at any one time. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about the first two, the personal grief. You know, I think it would be disingenuous uh, for me to project onto that. The, the only thing I will say about uh, those who are suffering personal grief of the loss of family or friends is that um, I have been fortunate to work at a university that gave faculty choice in whether or not they wanted to teach in person or teach online. Um, but many other universities, uh, faculty and staff and students did not have that option. And uh, the one thing I wanna say about this personalized grief is that um, when leaders making the decision to not allow choice uh, and whether or not to be in person. And yet knowing that people in their community have suffered this kind of personal loss, I find that the, that decision of forcing the issue to be unconscionable. I think higher ed deserves better than leaders who make those kinds of decisions. Uh, and I think you all, we all deserve, uh, deserve uh, better than that. And so that's the one thing I wanna say about that because uh, it has flown under the radar that people have made decisions to force people back into classrooms when they may have suffered tremendous loss and what that must have been like emotionally and psychologically. Um, there would need to be several more hours for us to talk about grief tied to personal events or uh, current events, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, our collective grief at the loss of what, uh, what we had imagined uh, higher ed was, what the work we were doing in higher ed, the work we loved about uh, going into the classroom and working with students or into our organizations and working with our colleagues, um, or if you're a student being together with, you know, with your peers in the classroom. Uh, the, the losses that have happened to the, the, way we, uh, the way we work and the way we act in higher education and how, how we have processed that collectively. That's really one of what I want to talk about, because that has been a tremendous loss and a tremendous change. And when you combine that element with what Maze Ahmad uh, in this uh, wonderful essay, and I've seen some of her workshops as well, and they've been terrific on this point too. You combine the grief with the trauma uh, aspect of what has happened as well, that, that it is a traumatic event uh, in addition to being a profound loss. Not all losses are traumatic necessarily, but this has been a collective trauma and not just an individualized trauma. And this is one, uh, one really important element of what Mays says here, uh, that uh, not only are faculty experiencing their own traumas, but they are taking on secondary traumatic stress from trying to help their students work through uh, the change uh, to, uh, to what they were doing during the pandemic, the effects of the pandemic, uh, having to deal with new technology and new courses and things that uh, we may never have had to wrestle with before, new formats that we may ne never have taught in before or learned in before um, that faculty were taking on a lot. And you, so you combine the grief uh, and the loss of this momentous crisis uh, and uh, you add the, tr the, the traumatic element to this and what you have is, is, well, I just, I just mentioned it a second ago, what you have is a crisis, a major crisis, not just of education, but of, of all, the, all the spheres that encase education, uh, faculty, students, staff, the, the, the ways that we live our lives that intersect with work, uh, but that go well beyond work. So it is a true crisis. So given that, you might expect that uh, the messages that we would hear from universities would be, we understand it's been a really hard time. We're taking that into account as we move forward. Um, but the message that I actually see uh, many universities uh, sending is this one, that we're going back to normal. We're going back to pre-pandemic operations. Uh, and this is one of my favorite movies. Um, 
look at Marty McFly's face right here. Marty McFly is all of us hearing the message that we are going back to normal pre-pandemic operations because uh, the truth is there is no going back. You cannot undo what has happened. You cannot go back to February or March of 2020 because the end of grief, the end of loss, the end of change is never a return. There's never a going back. There's only a different destination. Now I'll talk in a couple of minutes how that different destination doesn't mean bad or less than, but it is different. And so the idea that we could somehow go back to uh, you know March 1st of 2020, just to pick a date, is, is just, it's inconceivable. Uh, and it, it really uh, stretches, uh, it stretches the, the, I think the, the fabric of truth really. And it, it, what it does to the people who work in the systems and who learn in the system is it, it says, you know what? Forget about all the things that you just went through. Forget about all the things that you're dealing with and all the work that you did because we're just gonna skip over that, pretend that didn't happen, and we're gonna jump into, uh, into uh, the new normal um, and, and forget about all of, all of that and all the work that you all did. I think it's, um, it's uh, understandable from a rhetorical point of view. What do we want students to know? What do we want, what, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of message ultimately do we want to send? Well, we're back, okay? And we want, to, we want people to know that there's going to be in-person activities and, and things like that. But by saying we're going back to normal, back to the way it used to be, what we're actually doing is disregarding all the intense work that people did and all the loss that people are feeling and the grief that they're feeling. And so that's what we wanna talk about now is that, that process of reconciling that loss so that we can move and, uh, into the future, carve out a new future for higher ed that is not a return to the old ways, uh, but is, uh, is a different destination. Better, maybe, I don't know, but different, right? Um, okay, so we wanna then delve into that specific kind of grief. And I'm gonna use as my touchstone, one of the most profound allegories of grief that we have in our culture. Uh, this probably doesn't surprise uh, many of the people who are watching this right now, but uh, the movie Up, by Pixar from 2009 is as profound and uh, um, pointed an allegory of grief and loss as we have. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about this. I wanna use it uh, as a touchstone for talking about what I have seen on my own campus and what I've observed um, in talking to many of you, uh, what I've observed when I've uh, visited virtually other campuses. And that is uh, the, the, the different manifestations of this grief as the pandemic has unfolded. Uh, so for those of, uh, I can't imagine that there's anyone who hasn't seen that, but if there are people out there who have not seen this movie, uh, it, is, uh, it is fundamentally about a man, Carl, who loses his wife, Ellie, and um, he uh, attaches, as you can see in one of the pictures, hundreds of balloons to the house and it flies off uh, into uh, Paradise Falls, which he had, they had always planned on retiring to. Um, and it's about his journey. And it's about uh, his journey to process that loss, come to an understanding of what that loss meant and then to move forward. And um, I teach, uh, I've taught on several occasions and will teach uh, probably next year, a course on Pixar. Uh, we spend a few weeks on Up and one of the things uh, my students and I spend a lot of time on is talking about Carl's house as a metaphor for loss and grief. And so you can see in this first picture on the upper left, uh, for the early part of the film, he is immersed in his grief. He is, uh, he is uh, fundamentally surrounded by his loss at all times and so can never separate himself from it. Later, after the house lands at Paradise Falls, he's trying to get the house to the right place. And so he, he straps the house to his back, uh, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner. He's no longer immersed in the loss, but it is always present and weighing him down. 
Now the other character that you see in that picture, his name is Russell. Uh, he stows away in the house unbeknownst to Carl. And he is, um, he, uh, he's actually working through his own grief in the film. Uh, his parents are divorced and he's fallen out of touch with his father. Um, so uh, then in the, in, and they, their relationship is really a core part of both being able to move past the grief. Um, and then the final, the last picture here, that is the letting go. After, after developing relationships with not just Russell, but with a bird named Kevin and a dog named Doug, it all makes sense in the film, I promise you. Uh, he's able to reconcile his loss and let go. And so that shot that you see uh, in that picture is him having cut the house away and the house falling to the ground. He no longer needs to be surrounded by it because he has learned from it and has taken uh, those memories of Ellie with him as he creates a new life for himself. Um, now, while it is about a particular kind of loss, it does serve, I think, as an allegory for all the many kinds of grief that we might have. So I wanna use it to talk about our collective higher ed grief and loss that, uh, that we've experienced um, and, and uh, talk about some of my observations. So that, ha that uh, picture in the upper left-hand corner, him, uh, Carl, immersed by his grief, this to me is a lot of what I saw myself and what I, what I heard from conversations with, with many of you and with colleagues in higher ed. Um, was happening uh, during the spring of 2020, you know, right after the, the, sh the, emergence, uh, the emergency shift to remote learning. And then in the summer, as we were preparing for the fall as well. So what I mean by this is that we were immersed in the loss. We were immersed in the heaviness. We were immersed in, it was surrounding us at all times. Things were different. We were teaching largely in new environments. We were using technology uh, that we may never have used before. Students, uh, you know, we were trying to navigate our home life and keep our, you know, our family and friends safe. At the same time, we're trying to teach. Students are doing the same thing as learners. Staff are doing the same thing in their organizations. We were just immersed in it. And one thing I started to notice as uh, the spring went on and into the summer was, um, you know, uh, my role is in the uh, is working with faculty on teaching initiatives. And during this time, I was part of a larger team called Keep Teaching, where we were working with faculty on a daily basis to imagine what the, uh, what, um, the changes they needed to make in order to make the shift uh, workable for them and for their students. And what I started to notice was we would be talking about something and we were taking a very utilitarian approach. What do you need? What questions do you have? How can I help get you to the right place and find the right thing? So, but what, what I noticed was we'd be talking about something pretty innocuous, like, um, you know, a, a, some type of technology. And the responses I would see seemed, uh, seemed uh, not in alignment with the, the nature of the conversation. So we might be talking about Flipgrid, for example, and I would see extreme frustration, I would see anger, I would see sadness. And it struck me uh, after a few times of that, of that happening, that, what, that, that we were trying to put a Band-Aid by just working utilitarian on, okay, what do you need uh, in terms of technology or pedagogy? We were putting a Band-Aid over a much bigger issue. And that what was really, the, uh, at, what was really underneath all of this was a profound grief. And so we changed our approach at that moment to working with faculty, uh, not to start with, okay, what do you need in Blackboard, yada, yada. We didn't start with that anymore. Our workshops and our work with faculty started with what do you miss most about the teaching that you did just a few months ago? What do you miss most? Uh, what interactions with students did you find most meaningful? And how can I help you replicate those interactions in whatever environment you're teaching in now? So we tried to acknowledge the emotional component of this. What do you miss? We know it's hard. Talk to me about what you loved about it. And then let's, let's, use, let's use that to think about how we can replicate that experience, what you loved most about teaching in whatever environment the institution is saying you must now teach it. Um, because what I was seeing was, we're just not gonna have any success if all we're talking about is the nuts and bolts. 
We have to address the human beings in front of us and collectively in higher ed if we're going to uh, solve some of the major problems that were confronting us. So that was really, at least that's what I observed uh, in the early stages of the pandemic. And then as we transitioned out of summer and into the fall, and then I would say this spring as well, I think we, we sort of got to this place where um, that the, the, the immediacy of the crisis had fallen a bit into the background. And what, and, and what people were, dealing, were, were wrestling with now was, okay, let me get in the zone. Let me get in my routine. Let me figure out a way to control what is possible for me to control. A, a completely normal and human reaction to extreme loss. And I think what we saw a lot of was uh, uh, just putting our heads down and plowing forward. And honestly, what else were, are we supposed to do, right? And so I saw amazing innovation, amazing problem solving, but I also saw, uh, I also saw things pop up, like suddenly for, for some reason we were talking a lot about cheating and remote proctoring. And to me, that was initially a surprise. Like, why are we talking about this? This is like, that, that, I can't imagine anything less relevant at the moment. Um, <clears throat> But then it occurred to me that that is a response. That is, let me control what it is possible for me to control. And so while I definitely take one side in that debate about remote proctoring, get it out of here, um, I understand the debate. I understand the impulse behind it. Um, and that is when, when we're faced with a crisis, we try, to, we try to grab what it's possible for us to grab. But all of that is rooted in what we see happening to Carl here, uh, that the grief is that we're not acknowledging the grief, but it is tethered to us and weighing it down. That some of the conversations that are happening were happening in the fall and the spring were really about, well, uh, okay, I'm doing this now. I'm going to ignore the big house behind me that is tied to my back. What house, la la la, I don't see a house. Do you see a house? And so there was, uh, there was a lot of pushing it to the background so that we could plow forward, but that's not helping us. As you can see, he's weighed down by it. That's not helping us pave a way forward. That's keeping us tethered to the, the, the loss uh, in the past. Now, uh, I don't want to stretch the metaphor too far. I'm not sure uh, how to uh, bring Russell into this. I'll just say, let's pretend Russell is me cheering you all on as, as we're tethered to our grief moving forward. But the, the final step is the one that I think we uh, want to uh, talk about today. And that is, what do we do next? How do we let go of the, the, the traumatic loss that we have all collectively undergone and move forward? Now, I have some ideas but there are many possibilities here. I think the important part is that we come together and we talk about how do we do it? How, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And how do we work together to make it happen? Because we are not yet where Carl is in this picture. We are not yet at the point where the, ho the house is uh, floating away, that we have cut the tie to the house. We're we have not yet moved on. Um, as a collective. And so, but, but a higher ed, a post-pandemic higher ed depends on that. And so we have to think about how that might be possible. So I'm gonna offer some suggestions. I'd love to hear more of yours, you know, in the chat or in, on Twitter or via email, but here's some, here's some things that I think are really important to get us into the future beyond the past, beyond the present, looking forward to the future of higher ed. First of all, we have to simply acknowledge that it has been and it continues to be hard. I think that that's the most important thing. It's not easy to do. And so like Stevie, we might say, you know what, I'd rather not acknowledge that it's hard uh, because that gets into a lot of, uh, of feelings. And as Sarah Rose Cavanaugh always says, uh, we're not good about talking about feelings in higher education. So this is, a, I think, an important step, but also a very, very hard step uh, to take, acknowledging this is really hard. 
Um, and I've done a lot and we've all done a lot and we need to acknowledge that so that we can take the next step. It's also okay, like Stevie as well here to say, you know what? I think I'd rather not ever live through a pandemic again. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that I've had enough of the pandemic and it's been hard and I wanna move on now. And that's okay too. But acknowledging it, I think is really important. <clears throat> this one is one I wanna spend a little bit of time on because I think it's crucial. Acknowledging before we can carve a path forward, we have to acknowledge that we individually and institutions have changed. That is one thing that I think is universal about the process of grief. It changes you uh, and it changes institutions. And the, I think the, the silver line, the optimistic part of this, and I don't think we talk enough about this, <clears throat> is that that change does not have to be bad. It is different. I think there's a connotation here that if we are changed by an event, uh, it's a loss and it doesn't have to be. It, the change itself does not have to be bad, but it does have to be recognized that I am not what I was, that, uh, that my institution is not what it was, that higher ed is not what it used to be. It is something different now and that's okay. Let's take that difference and let's make it the best future that we can. Uh, I love this passage from uh, Lee Bissett's blog uh, post spring that she, she posted uh, last month. We have been changed by all this. Uh, we will uh, we uh, need to carry those changes forward for better or worse. We have been, I have been changed and I'm unfamiliar to myself. And that may be true also of higher education, but we had to do these two things uh, because uh, not recognizing it. And this is where I think our institutions and our leaders come into play. Not recognizing this is setting higher ed and our individual institutions up for failure. If you're just going to elide over what has happened, if you are not going to help the community acknowledge these things, you can never say, okay, you can never say, here's a marking point by which we, uh, at which we acknowledge the past so that we can move forward together. I think another way to do this, uh, the next step, uh, an important step, forging hope together brick by brick. Um, as Kevin Gannon's book, uh, great book, Radical Hope reminds us, hope is an action verb. It is not a passive verb. Uh, it requires action on our parts to be born into reality. And so uh, part of that means, act, it, it, well, a lot of it means we take action. We must do something in order <clears throat> to build hope uh, for ourselves and for each other as a community. So how can we do that? What are the steps that we can take to build that hope so that we can, uh, we can use it as a tool for reinventing higher ed post-pandemic? Well, one of, the, uh, one of the necessary steps, one of those actions that I think we have to take, we need to reflect as individuals and as institutions on what we have learned. If uh, yes, we certainly need to process the loss but the other side of that coin is reflecting on what we've learned. What has, what has gone, what have we done that has worked in higher ed uh, or in our own classes? Uh, and what have we done that hasn't worked? And how can we use information from both of those buckets to uh, make better decisions going forward? So some ways that I think we can reflect, um, my institution, I know other institutions um, have heavily surveyed uh, students, faculty, and staff about what has worked well and what hasn't worked well. And I know that no one wants more surveys. No one wants to be surveyed again. I get that. But uh, if we do it the right way and we make clear that we are actually going to use the information from the surveys, because that's where uh, that's where I think a lot of things fall through the cracks when it doesn't get used. Um, if we actually use the, the information that we get from the surveys, I think that it uh, we, can uh, we can use that as a guidepost for making informed decisions about what people feel worked well and what didn't work well, how we can, um, how we can kind of implement that going forward. Campus listening sessions. Um, I, I hope there are some universities that are doing this. I think it, uh, it is essential, uh, or at least it's a good idea to just bring people together and to have 
reflective listening sessions. Ideally, the, the administration uh, would be interested in hearing from the constituencies at a university uh, about their individual and collective experiences so that they can use that information. Now, this could be, you know, this could be centralized listening sessions. It could be sponsored by units like the CoLab at Plymouth State or, or teaching centers or faculty development centers or, or other kinds of units. But um, I, hearing people's own experiences is a crucial ingredient, uh, I think, to, um, to a, a future after the pandemic. Workshops that use lessons learned as a framing device. Um, so here I'm thinking more uh, along lines of my uh, compadres in teaching and learning centers where we, uh, we think a lot about, okay, what can we do to help, the, to, to help our colleagues prepare for the fall, something like that, right? And we could say, okay, a lot of people um, that we've seen uh, from the data we've collected are interested in doing more with this thing that they used over the last few months. So we can create a workshop around that. Or alternatively, uh, we, can, we can sponsor workshops that connect specifically to some of these emotional and psychological components that we've talked about. So we brought in uh, Rebecca Pope Rourke from Georgia Tech, who, uh, who presented on burnout to our faculty and we, uh, she also spoke to our provost and, and his team about that. Uh, we had our campus counselors come in to talk about student mental health and how that might manifest in the classroom. So uh, combining these kinds of, uh, these sort of different sorts of workshops through the lens of what can I learn from this? What, what have we seen and how can we move that forward? I think um, is an important part of this. And then other creative ideas as well. I recently had the opportunity to um, speak uh, at Adelphi University, and they had this phenomenal idea that I saw on their conference page, um, a faculty testimonial wall that, uh, with videos of faculty talking about the challenges, successes, uh, and other experiences of teaching during the pandemic. And uh, you know, it'll be, uh, they use the word memorialized here, it'll be archived uh, for, for the future so that um, they, there's a record of these experiences that hopefully can be used as a tool. I love this idea. I think there's lots of different ways that we could play around with the concept, but it, it strikes me that here is a demonstrated commitment to learning from individual experiences to help shape the future of the university. So we have to reflect. If we move from acknowledgement to, uh, to hope, to reflection. We got to put it into action. And then we have to find that pathway forward, that, that the end result of this, remember uh, it, the, the end is not a return, the end is something different. And what that different thing is, what that future is, is really uh, a matter of who is at the table, who uh, comes up with the ideas, who has the agency and the social capital to move those ideas forward. Uh, the image that I've selected uh, not and did intentionally because it's not a nicely paved path. It's rocky, it's rough, and that's the way I see the next few months or even the next few years. You know, have to carve it out for ourselves. In many ways, there will be, I think, uh, struggle and compromise uh, as to what that vision will be and how that vision can be enacted. 5A, how are we gonna, what, what do we do to carve that path? Uh, well, first thing I think is important to me um, is that we keep centering our students, our faculty and our staff in our practices and our policies. So one of the, one of the silver linings or one of the, the bright spots in this dark time of the last 15 months has been that for, for the first time, certainly in my career, uh, the spotlight was put on issues of student, um, uh, of student agency, empathy, flexibility for the first time. So universities at the drop of a hat <laughs> changed their grading policy to pass fail in many cases. I know not every place did that, but it happened really quickly. Uh, I know uh, Laura Gibbs kept a running tally of universities that, was, uh, that were switching to that. Um, I cannot imagine 
anything else that could have happened to force the conversation about grading and actually make a change like that happen. Same is true of the discussion about flexible attendance, about flexible deadlines, about uh, student workload, about the kinds of assessments and assignments were given. The spotlight was cast, uh, at, at least on the student side, of how do we recognize the humanity of students and how do we use that in our pedagogy? Um, so we need to continue that. Uh, I think we're in an important moment where the spotlight is fading on that a little bit. We need to continue that work. The same is true of faculty. We got new, uh, and staff, we got new policies at our university, uh, at, our, at our universities that we're recognizing, okay, well, uh, remote work and flexible work in many cases and uh, other, other ways of being flexible, you know, uh, at some universities, the tenure clock was extended, some universities, um, uh, student evaluations were suspended for a year or more. So this, uh, this nod toward or this extension toward humanity and empathy uh, was kind of uh, widespread across the board, um, even acknowledging that, in, that there may be some institutions uh, that, that didn't go that route. I say higher ed writ large, it was a pretty consistent theme. I know in my own reflections, and this is the only time I'll mention how humans learn, which was really what, uh, as Robin said, uh, the, the initial impetus for, uh, for um, having a conversation about this. And it, as I reflect on that move toward empathy and toward flexibility, I, I think a lot about the, the elements of this book that I stressed before the pandemic and what I have, uh, what have really seen flourish and come to believe to be even more important after or, or during the pandemic as well. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, before all this happened, I would talk a lot about curiosity and failure that, that made up the bulk of the, the kind of talks and workshops I did. But now I focus a lot more on sociality you know, our social nature as human beings um, and the, the necessity of social connection for learning. And I think about what that means. I think about how to do it uh, when you are uh, in person, socially distanced and in masks. I think about how you do it in synchronous uh, online learning and asynchronous learning. And there are people who've done amazing work creating social presence in all of those environments. But uh, to me, this has become the critical issue, uh, that, uh, uh, or at least one of the top three critical issues that have emerged in higher education from the teaching side uh, in the pandemic. How, what happens when people are cut off from each other? What happens uh, even when uh, we have a screen mediating those social interactions? And I don't have tons of answers about that, but what I, what I do see is just how important it has become for these conversations. Uh, and the other element has been this one. We've been talking, I've been talking about this for you know, the last half an hour, but the emotional component of learning uh, and people and students as emotional complex human beings, faculty and staff as emotional complex human beings. This, uh, the last 15 months have shown very starkly why that matters for what we do as educators. That when, when people are faced with an emotional crisis, their ability to learn is diminished. And we have seen multiple instances of this at every campus that we represent, I'm sure. But uh, we ignore the emotional, and I believe this more strongly now than when I wrote the book, we ignore the emotional component of learning at our peril as institutions. We have to focus more on it. And I hope, I hope what happens as a result of, uh, of, of what we have seen over the last 15 months is that we pay more attention to those elements going forward. And I wanna end with this um, because I think ultimately we are at a critical moment in, in the work that has happened over the course of the pandemic. And so what I was just talking about <clears throat> was the way the conversation shifted suddenly during the pandemic. But what I'm noticing now, and maybe, uh, you know, this could just be Josh, uh, this might not be your experience. And I'd be, love to hear what your experience is. 
what I'm noticing is that that conversation is now starting to fade again into the background as administrators go about their business thinking about you know normal pre-pandemic operations and as people retreat to their silos that uh, that we're losing some of that spotlight that we had and so uh, I think though that this is our moment we cannot yield the floor I had this image of uh, old Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Um, I won't do my Jimmy Stewart impression for you all right now. Uh, but what I will say is that there's a critical scene in this movie where he is filibustering for you know, a, a social justice cause. And uh, the, the senators who are against him keep trying to get him to yield the floor. Will the gentleman yield his time? Will the gentleman yield his time? And there is a moment right, right here in the film where he just slams his hands down and says, no, I will not yield. And I think we, all of us who care about education and who care about students are at that moment right now where they're trying to take the conversation back and force higher ed into a pigeonhole, an imaginary pigeonhole of what it used to be. Remember, we can't go back. So that's kind of an illusion that, we're, that, that there's an effort underway to, uh, to take the floor back. And I don't think we can yield it. And here's how I think we hold the floor uh, on the conversation about uh, creating a more equitable higher ed, a higher ed that is focused on learning and a higher ed that helps all of us succeed. First, we continually promote the data and scholarship about the effects of the pandemic. We keep that in front of people all the time. And so, for example, that uh, this great new essay about instructional design that Jesse and Martha published just last week, I've been giving that thing out like candy at trick or treat. Uh, it is amazing and it addresses so many of the key issues that have come up. Uh, we need to keep that in front of the people who make decisions. Uh, work on the pedagogy of care by Kate Denial and Mahabali. Work on the humanizing of pedagogy by Michelle Bukansky Brock and Karen Costa relationship rich education, Peter Felton, Harriet Schwartz, inclusive teaching, Kelly Hogan and Vijay Sathy, Kimberly Tanner, Brian Dewsbury, science of learning, Jim Lang, Sarah Rose Cavanaugh, Michelle Miller, the list could go on and on, but we have to keep that work in front of people. And, and we cannot, uh, we, we can't let them look away. We have to keep it there and say, this is what, this is what we know about how humans learn. This is what we know about what people have experienced during the pandemic. There are new papers coming out um, every week uh, utilizing qualitative and quantitative data that, uh, that helps to emphasize some of, uh, some of the more reflective pieces that I was just mentioning there. But we need to keep it in front of people. Secondly, we need to refuse to let the conversation change. Every, uh, this, is, this is what I'm talking about when I, I see it receding, that, that great conversation that we were having, I see it receding. We have to hold the floor. We can't yield the floor. We have to keep the conversation going. Um, so when uh, things start to move in the direction of, well, you know, uh, obviously we, have, we uh, can go back to, you know, uh, long form assessments uh, without any, uh, any flexibility for deadlines or something like that. Um, we, need to, we need to confront that and say, well, that's not what we did just a few months ago. Why do we have to go back now? Um, that students will remember the changes that we made for them and they will not forget and they will wonder why are we going back? Faculty and staff will not forget the changes that were made to uh, to help their work conditions be more flexible and to center them in the process. They won't forget. And, and so we ignore that and we create a system that was less equitable than it was before because now people know that it's possible to change. And so we have to keep that conversation going. We cannot let it change. We can't yield the floor on that one either. And finally, and I know this is more idealistic, um, oh, one other point about that second bullet point that I think is important. I also understand 
that uh, it is more possible for some people to uh, kind of force the conversation than it is for others, uh, takes positions of, of privilege and agency. And I know some folks in contingent positions may not feel like they have the agency to, uh, to do that. Um, I think uh, we need to all find our allies in those conversations. Um, and if you have power to utilize that power, uh, but I also wanna stress that this doesn't have to be isolated. This doesn't have to be an individualized response to anything. We can do this work as a community. We can come together in our various groups via social media, via lots of uh, different forums to do that work together so no one feels isolated. So then the, th the third bullet here, I know this is idealistic, but I feel like I have to mention it because I know every single person uh, on this uh, who is watching this cares deeply about education and about learning. That another way that we don't yield the floor is by taking the floor. And um, what I mean by that is to get people who care deeply about those things into leadership positions. And that doesn't even mean the highest level of leadership positions, although that certainly is something I'd love to see, uh, but it does mean taking, uh, taking opportunities to serve on key committees, uh, to putting applications in for leadership roles. And I'm happy to talk to anyone at all who uh, would be considering that kind of move. Uh, about what it would mean and, and how to strategize. But I think that this, we, for higher ed to really achieve its goals and the vision, the possibility for what it can be after the pandemic, that we need the people who care the most to be in our leadership roles so that we can actually make change happen and continue it. Because the reality is that, um, that, the, that there is a pull, a strong inertia to go back to things that look the way it used to be. And the only way we can stop that inertia is to push back together as a community. I think uh, the future of higher ed depends on it. I see a lot of reason to be optimistic and to have hope about that future, especially when talking to everyone who is here in this room with us today. So. Thank you very much. Thanks to Robin for the invitation and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, I really can't tell you how alive the chat was. It was so <laughs> alive that I missed, you know, 95% of it. Um, for folks who want to please continue this conversation over on Twitter. Um, at hashtag PSU open, and we can all engage in that in a nice slow chat over the next few days. So there's no pressure, you know, to get to get to that right away. Um, a lot of people in the chat were asking if this would be recorded and shared. We um, it has been recorded, and we absolutely will be posting this um, in front of any paywall, so you can share this with your friends and colleagues. Um, I want to thank Josh so much for sharing his expertise. Um, and his compassion um, and his, his candid uh, discussion with us. I know um, we got moved through the full range of emotions, which I think means we were definitely learning. Um, and I wanna invite folks from Plymouth State, which basically means anybody who has a Plymouth State email, um, please come in five minutes at uh, 5.05. We will meet you in the other Zoom room. You can check your email. Um, if you need the link to that. So thanks everybody for being with us. And with that, we are going to conclude this webinar.